So on behalf of the Schulich <coughs> and the Western University, I welcome all of you for this homecoming event. I would like to introduce our distinguished uh, lecture awardee, Dr. Polak. His topic actually very timely. If some of you are, have been here this morning, we have a distinguished panel on narcotic crisis in the country. It touched on the whole social health and healthcare issue in our healthcare system. We're only as good in our treatment for disease and healthcare if we can be strengthened every single ring of the circle of care. We're only as good as our weakest link. And social determinant poverty is one of the issues in many, many diseases we're facing with. Dr. Pollock graduated from our school, the Zurich School of Medicine and Dentistry in 1958, after an internship in Montreal General and moved to Colorado. He has an extensive training in psychiatry after he practiced in Denver, the high mountain for over 20 years. It was during this time he took interest in the homelessness among the veterans and those who have mental illness and really passionately talking about community-based psychiatric care. And he demonstrated a practical and innovative approach to the problem of the patient that he served. He published many, many academic papers in psychiatry research and clinical method. In 1981, Dr. Pola <coughs> actually established a company called International Development Enterprise to create solution, not just treatment, but try to create solution to harness the power of market, to empower the rural poor to lift themselves out from poverty. The use of some low cost, affordable technology such as the treadle pump irrigation and a, and a deep irrigation system that he's going to tell us more was the key for some of those low income, poor, poverty, homeless people be able to lift themselves out from the social economic spectrum. And this approach for the years of his clinical work and successful approach attract many, many grants recognized and validated with 14 million of grant funding in 20, 2006 and 27 million in 2008 from the Built and Melinda Gate Foundation. The work that he established impact on 30 million families to escape the brutal poverty in their life cycle. In 2008, he published the first book out of poverty, what work when traditional method fail, which present in detail how he will highlight to us to have an alternative approach in the standard method in addressing poverty in our social system. Dr. Pola is a co-founder and CEO of the Windhouse International, a for-profit social venture with mission to develop affordable, safe, and innovative product and services, which are income generating and tailored for the very poor to benefit from the three billion customer uh, who live on less than $2 a day. And during the past 30 years, he worked with thousands of people in the country, around the group, to help design and produce low cost, income generating product that moved two million people out of poverty. Dr. Pollock had commit himself to truly passionately finding solution to this extreme poverty, to break the cycle of disease and illness. So we are very fortunate for him to homecoming to us and come back and share with us his idea, his innovation this morning, and how we can really look at this social economic problem and move our health and health care in a new dimension. With that, please join me and welcome Dr. Pola. Dr. 
Dr. Chen pretty much summarized everything I had to say. Uh, any qu <laughs> uh, Any questions? <laughs> well, I'm delighted to be here, and it's nice to see so many old friends. Here's Al Dirksen. Uh, Dr. Chen talked about IDE. Al uh, became the uh, uh, director of IDE a, a, a few years after I handed it over, and IDE is still going on. Uh, as Dr. Chen said, I'm, I'm going to be talking about poverty and illness, and there's a voluminous literature about how poverty and, uh, is a causative factor in all kinds of illness, uh, medical, <coughs> physical illness, psychiatric illness. Um, but what isn't very well described is what are simple practical solutions to poverty? And uh, after I graduated from medical school here uh, and did the internship in Montreal, I ended up seeing psychiatric patients but quickly learned. So I'll just give you a, a, an overview and, and an example of some of the things that I ran into. Uh, I was head of the crisis unit at Fort Logan Mental Health Center in Denver. and in came somebody who was hallucinating and schizophrenic and smelled death. And we provided some medication, made him better. But we noticed that there was somebody sitting outside in the waiting room. And we asked him to come join us and find out who he was. Turned out that this was like 40 years ago. And they were in a gay marriage. And they were at the point of breaking up. And his symptoms were very much related to breaking up. And when he, he had this symptom of smelling death, well, his mother had died two years previously. And she was somewhat dominating and telling him what to do. And his partner also told, told him what to do a lot. And when he faced splitting up with his partner and he became psychotic, the symptom of smelling death was a creative expression of being upset about the possibility of losing his partner, and it reminded him of his mother's death, so he smelled death. Uh, we then started talking to both of them about why they were thinking of splitting up. They had sexual problems and the usual stuff, and his symptoms began to get a lot better. So after six sessions of sort of crisis therapy, doing basically marital counseling. Now, in those days, keep in mind, if you were gay, you don't come out of the closet. He was a school teacher. If he came out of the closet, he was afraid he'd lose his job. So in addition to having a breakup, potentially, they couldn't really get help anywhere. And that was so striking, so that from then on, I always looked at the social system crisis, which was two-thirds of the reason most people ended up coming to the hospital. And a little bit later, it became clear that the environmental context of families in crisis was just as important to their crisis as the families were to the individual patient symptoms. And the most significant group of variables about environmental uh, upheavals was poverty. So I began to learn about poverty and we did a, a bunch of stuff with housing for acutely mentally ill people and uh, jobs because that was very important to readmission. And then I realized that people I was helping, trying to help in Denver, Colorado, who were poor, were making two, three thousand bucks a year at least, uh, even if they were on welfare. And on a world scale, they were quite wealthy. So then we got curious about what, what was poverty like when people lived on two bucks a day. And the key thing that helped form ideas about mental illness and poverty in, in, in the West came from, I decided to learn as much as I could. And I then proceeded to interview a thousand successive patients about to be admitted and go and talk to their families and learn about the so social context. And when we moved into $2 a day poverty, 
did the same thing. So everything I'm going to tell you today is what I learned from poor people and their families as my teachers and friends. Uh, and it just changed everything for me in terms of uh, what is the problem and what do you do about it. So I'm going to uh, take you through some slides. Let's see, going ahead. Here is our anatomy table. And uh, along with Lazarus. Uh, <laughs> and this was the about the time that we did, uh, in the anatomy class, it was 600 hours lab. And whenever somebody in a dissection came upon a congenital anomaly, that was a big deal. Everybody gathered around and they gave a talk. So. In this instance, we had a congenital anomaly called the humeral suspension. And I called everybody over to the table and gave a 15 minute lecture, which was all total garbage. <laughs> but it sounded very impressive. And at the end of the lecture, we uh, pulled aside the drapes that we had piled around the humeral suspension. And the humeral suspension was actually a humerus bone that I lifted up Lazarus' leg and put the humerus bone under it, and that was the humeral suspension. <laughs> so my fellow classmates were not happy with me. Uh, so as we learned about poverty, poverty became a major thing, and we started learning about poverty, and then not long afterwards, it became clear that there were other organizations interested in poverty, including the Catholic Church. So the Pope had a symposium on poverty, and so this went from Lazarus to, to Pope Francis. These are some beautiful, happy young children in London, actually. And here's their equivalent in Rwanda. But what isn't so clear about these happy kids is that in a place like Rwanda, a lot of them never survived to get to that stage. So here's a summary. I, I think this is all well known. You probably all know about it. Uh, but uh, this is an example uh, of representative countries. Canada has a per capita income of 48,000, at least in 2017. And the Deaths per thousand live births is 4.9. USA and Canada, about five. Now you see, if you, in the case of Zambia, where in 2017 the per capita income was just under 4,000, about one-tenth of the per capita income here, the deaths per live births was 61, and in India, 40. So it's about 10 times the death, just the death rate. So you can imagine the, the difference in incidence and prevalence of illness of all kinds and the impact of poverty. Now, it's difficult to know whether what's the chicken and what's the egg, but I think that it's, there's no question that there's a dramatic impact on illness uh, by poverty. Here's another example on a different way of looking at this. There are a number of door-to-door -door surveys of illness. So the Midtown Manhattan study was done about 50 years ago. Uh, people uh, took a random sample of 1,600, over 1,600 people door-to-door -door in Manhattan. And then they, uh, when the family agreed, they evaluated the whole family and uh, listed what illnesses they found. Now, interestingly enough, there were about over a third of the people that they interviewed had had some serious illness with a serious disability and uh, uh, significant symptoms. Uh, and then, when they published their findings, they looked at the illness rates by income. So here is a summary of what they found. Uh, and this is the sick-well ratio and in the, in the highest economic group, which is to the far left, A in that slide, 
it would be an average of about 40 on that scale. And on the poorest group, it was 1,020. So 20 times the uh, illness rate. So there's a profound impact on incidence and prevalence of all types of illnesses according to the socioeconomic. And, and it's especially clear at the poorest group and the uh, most prosperous group. So here's the basic question that I would like to pose to you today and I pose to Dr. Chen. If poverty is more important than bacteria in the causal chain of illness, why isn't poverty taught as a basic science in every medical and nursing school, including here? And what I mean by that, there's a lot of already existing data on poverty and uh, its role in illness. But what isn't taught and should be taught is practical solutions to poverty. And when I saw that as a problem and interviewed a thousand uh, people who were poor, the solutions to poverty became very clear. When I asked people why they were poor, they said they were poor because they didn't have enough money. And I asked them then, well, how would you What's a practical way to be, be, move out of poverty? Well, we need to learn how to make more money. All right, so uh, that wasn't too mysterious. And uh, when you ask the same question of rural poor in a country like Bangladesh, the next question is, well, how do you earn your livelihood now? Well, most of them earn their livelihood from, from farming agriculture, either being hired, uh, if, they, if they had no, if they were landless, they w worked on farms. And more commonly, they had an acre or two in scattered plots, and they tried to make a living. And on those scattered plots, they tended to grow most of their crops when it rained. There are two monsoon seasons in Bangladesh. They grew rice, wheat, and corn. But rice, wheat, and corn you might be able to grow enough to feed your family for most of the year, but you try to sell extra rice, wheat, and corn, and everybody else is growing it in the same rainy season, so the price is low. You can't make much money. So when I talk to them about what are the opportunities to make more money, well, there's a dry season. In Bangladesh, there's a, it's a winter season. It's, say, between September and May. And it's quite dry, and there isn't water for your crops, so not so many crops are grown. But because it rains so much all year, by the way, there's room down here if somebody wants to come down here and sit. Um, there's so much rain during the most of the year that there are aquifers uh, 12 feet down. So literally, in the dry season, if you could put a straw down and suck up some water and irrigate some crops, you could make good money. Well, there already was a way of doing exactly that. It's called a treadle pump. Uh, uh, a guy named Gunnar Barnes who, from Lutheran World Service uh, had developed this pump where if you walk on two bamboo treadles alternately like this, and it's, uh, it, that's the most efficient biomechanical way of using energy because everybody knows how to walk. You can activate these twin pistons and use that to suck up water. And a treadle pump, uh, but you need to drill a well and put a filter down where the sand layer is and uh, uh, put in the pump. Well, it turns out that already there were well drillers called mysteries in Bangladesh. There were workshops uh, that made things like bed springs that had welders. So we recruited 2,000 workshops, uh, a couple of thousand village dealers who were already selling things and they sold a treadle pump at a 15% margin. We trained mysteries how to install a treadle pump so there are no leaks because it's a suction pump. And we created a whole network of enterprises to make, deal, 
and install treadle pumps. But then the missing link, so that was all fine. That wasn't as challenging. The missing link is marketing because unless you can mass market to a population that at that time, half of them didn't read and write, you'd have trouble making any impact. So we started looking at how people mass marketed, marketed things. And the most useful learning was from the cigarette companies. And you know what they did to mass market to that population? Bollywood movies. They would make a Bollywood movie advertising cigarettes. They'd play in villages using a generator. And they'd have dealers and, and they'd contract with local uh, mom and pop shops. In, uh, uh, in many places they're called Karana shops, but they're all over the world. And those shops would sell. So we did the same thing. We created a Bollywood movie about the treadle pump. <laughs> and uh, we, we learned from the tobacco companies, it was a real tearjerker. A boy, boy meets girl, they want to get married, but they can't get married because to get married, the, the father of the bride has to come up with a dowry, but they didn't have enough money for a dowry, so they couldn't get married. And every Bollywood movie has a... a, a, a a wedding, a funeral, uh, sadness, uh, all kinds of things. Though we included all of those things. So when, <laughs> when they couldn't get married and there was a, at the middle of the climax, we had an intermission. Now these movies played to an average audience of two or 3,000, open air setting. And during the break, we had the village dealers with model treadle pumps, so they put customers up on treadle pumps after the break. Then the father met an old friend who told him about the treadle pump. So he bought a treadle pump and he made a lot of money and uh, they got married and lived happily ever after. But that took uh, probably about an hour and a half. Uh, but that helped uh, both make people aware of the product, give them a chance to try it on and pump with it, and then following that, the dealers would uh, talk to the customers that they had. They would bring their potential customers to the, to the act, and, and uh, it helped sales. So stuff like that, it's not what we learned in medical school, but uh, it's, it's what made a big difference. So in the end, with all of this, and we got a grant from uh, CEDA, Canadian International Development, uh, uh, and uh, we used that to primarily to market. And uh, at the end, IDE successfully sold something like two million treadle pumps uh, and made a huge impact on income. So that was a real learning process for me about practical solutions to poverty. Haven't come back and done the same thing in the, in the US, but I think the same process would work equally well. And it's not that mysterious. So I want to go into a little bit more detail about how this works. And, and part of it is that you start, I started with the individual and symptoms and how to treat the individual. So here's representation of the individual with uh, maybe depression. Um, but then I learned very quickly that that individual with symptoms is represented by uh, some kind of upheaval in the social system that the individual is a part of. And that in turn is very significantly influenced by the environment. So this is, and, and, and poverty is the most important of those variables. So I want to pause there and have a chance. If, if any of you have any questions at this point, we can start with the process and uh, then continue. And I'll show you in more detail. Any ideas, any questions? Yes, sir. Yep. I think, I'm just thinking, you know, poverty in this country, I've been to Panama, I do some outreach work, and I realized that my work and do the most work is really in my own 
backyard. Yep. So, uh, uh, can everybody hear? No. Okay, he's a family doctor. So, so as a family physician, you use groups that people come into groups. Right. Do, uh, have you gone out to their homes to see what the, and their workplaces to see what it, uh, what they're experiencing? So, so I think it's, I think the poverty in our country is not necessarily just money. I think it's poverty in the spirits, it's knowledge. Right. So I find that you know what I can see people who are very wealthy and their kids are just as messed up. Yeah. Right? I have colleagues, uh, you know, they just have the same issues. But I think you know this poverty can be expanded. So, so anyways, that's what I do, and okay. I think education is key. So I, I find that one-on-one -on -one education works, but uh, it's not scalable, and not necessarily better in a group setting. So I do what's called self, a physician that's self-management groups and uh, self-support groups. And this is all recommended so, by, you know, CDA and so on. So this is, this is very interesting, and, and it's one uh, example. I guess the question I would have is, what is the context in this country of poverty of the patients that you see and to what extent uh, for instance uh, do they have problem with jobs and I agree with you it's it's simple simplifying things too much to say that money is everything but when you're on two dollars a day and your family doesn't eat uh, uh, goes hungry for a couple of months then then uh, increasing income is the first significant thing but it's not the answer to everything uh, and I would totally agree with you a lot of people with money have problems as well. Uh, yes. So the prologue, maybe we'll get you finish your talk and then we'll save the question to the end. Um, we, and I will instruct you, actually you have a button in front of you. If you press that button, then your microphone will be hot and then you'll be able to, people can see you uh, for the question as well. So we can, we can contextualize some of the discussion regarding the poverty yeah. in different region and then how we can contextualize and how we uh, in our society be able to, yeah. to move forward. So Doctor, I just want to make sure that you can finish your talk. Okay, so. yeah, I can, I can finish. Dr. Chen, like if they press a button, do I get a shock? <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably not. Well, that's good. Okay. So at the time I prepared this, there was two billion people who live on less than two dollars a day in the world. Uh, it's probably uh, less than that now, it's between one and two billion, but it's still a huge number of people. But, for the most part, conventional development aid has failed, uh, although there are some successes. Corporate social responsibility, in many cases, a lot of companies are involved in corporate social responsibility, but a lot of those, especially earlier, were, were cosmetic. Charity, if you give people food that are hungry, it helps, but it's, temper it's fleeting. So charity doesn't really bring people out of poverty. It, it may help. And if mobile phone companies can earn huge profits, why can't social companies, social enterprises? And in my view, the two billion or so bypass two dollar a day customers represent huge opportunities to create new markets, gain brand loyalty, and earn big profits. So the follow on question is, if we could help 200 million two dollar a day customers double their income, what impact would we have on global illness? Because this is a 
the school is interested in health. So here's an example. I told you about the treadle pump. This is a teenage girl work, uh, using a treadle pump to irrigate crops during the dry season. Uh, it's a perfect example. Uh, that treadle pump costs in Bangladesh $25 with a profit for the uh, manufacturer and the well driller and the dealer who sells it. Uh, and uh, on the average, our follow-up studies indicated that if a farmer would invest $25 in local currency, the average net return in the first growing season was $100 after all expenses. And the really savvy farmers earned $500 on a $25 investment. That kind of return is very attractive then because you can, you can set up credit and the people who loan money are likely to get their money back. So we started an organization called IDE. That was a nonprofit uh, designed to treat poor people as customers instead of as recipients of charity. And I told you about the Bollywood movie. This is an example of a Bollywood a movie playing uh, in, in an open air setting. So I believe anything that you do to help poor people should have measurable impact and scale. So IDE's first 25 years, we got uh, received a total of 78 million over 25 years in grants from government and other agencies and, and, and investments. Poor people living on less than $2 a day invested 139 million in things like the treadle pump followed up later by low cost drip irrigation. And the smallholder aggregate net return on that investment was $288 million a year. My contention is that that kind of return is available in just about every situation. May not be as great and uh, it varies with the different situations. So here's another problem as an illustration affordable solar irrigation. India spends six billion a year to subsidize irrigation pumping because it's so important in food production and ma making the country self-sufficient in food. And that six billion represents a quarter of, its, of the country's annual deficit. So we recruited a group of space engineers from Ball Aerospace, and they were designing uh, space vehicles and so on, and they found it really intriguing to work on village, designing simple village technology. And we gave them the problem of cutting the cost of existing solar irrigation for small farms by 80%. And market that through the private sector. They did that. This is, uh, this is one of their test systems. And we then took uh, examples of the system that they designed and tested it in uh, eight farms in Gujarat. And this is one of those farms, and this is a kid, I guess, walking along. Um, that's a gravity tank, by the way. The, the water, because solar the sun only shines optimally a certain part of the time of the time. So you need a uh, time of the day. So you needed a storage mechanism. So we pumped into a tank and then the tank would be used to uh, drip irrigate by gravity. So we combined this solar uh, pumping with the design of an affordable, low cost drip irrigation system that cut the use of water by at least uh, a th two thirds, uh, putting water directly at the plant. And here are the, some of the results. Uh, a, a one acre system, in this case, it's much bigger than what you do with the smallest farmers, uh, cost about $2,200, including a one acre drip irrigation system, 
uh, and the solar pumping system that lifted the water. Uh, but the average profit then was $1,120 less than, uh, it, it took two years to get payback, but still that was in the uh, range of what would be uh, saleable through a private sector market system. And of course, uh, the prices come down as the volume goes up. So this is the final example, and then I'll be done. We'll have a chance to have a lot of discussion. This is a current, uh, so after IDE, uh, after about 25 years, I handed over IDE. IDE is a nonprofit using business principles is now, in how many countries, Al? 13? Uh, and uh, it has helped something like, by this time, 30 million $2 a day people double their income. And that's, that you might think that that's good, but compared to a billion or two, it's still a drop in the bucket. So after handing over IDE, I'm now working on creating three global companies, uh, a new version of a frontier multinational. Each one, if successful, will help 100 million $2 a day customers move out of poverty. I don't know if we'll get it done, but we're on the way. So uh, this, the last part is uh, the one that's furthest along. It's called Spring Health in India, and it sells safe drinking water, delivering it to the doors of poor people in rural villages in India at a cost of about seven cents a day, which is less than half of what people pay now to treat the illnesses they get from drinking bad water. And here are the components. The first is a radically affordable way of purifying drinking water. There's a lot of water available in, many, in most parts of India, but it's contaminated with fecal pathogens. So the best uh, way around the world that's uh, the most uh, cost-effective way is chlorinating. Well, how do you get chlorine distributed in remote rural areas? Well, you teach a, a partner, a local shopkeeper, to first create a 5% salt solution, which is not that challenging. Then there is a technology that we used from Switzerland called electrochlorination. You put a couple of electrodes in that salt water and run trickle electricity, and that converts sodium chloride uh, is salt. And that creates mixed chlorine oxidants, which is the same as uh, chlorinating water. So one liter of the uh, fluid that you get after a, a few hours, the uh, water bubbles with the electric current. If you add a liter of that fluid to a, a, it'll, uh, to a tank, a 4,000 liter tank that has water contaminated with fecal pathogens, it will sterilize that water to make it safe to drink. So we created a system of local dealers. One of, one of those electrochlorinators, which costs about 200 bucks, will do uh, 50 households. Uh, so that's, the other, that, that's a picture of the electrochlorination, uh, how, how it works. Uh, normally, the most, uh, the, the most common way of purifying drinking water in these areas is uh, re reverse osmosis. But uh, at the time that we looked into this, it may be cheaper now. The cheapest reverse osmosis system was 4,000 bucks, and it did 4,000 liters a day. 5,000 bucks, sorry. And the $250 electrochlorinator uh, will end up treating 80,000 liters a day. So the first step is always to find something radically affordable that is effective. And usually, if you, if you use those criteria for design, you can do it. Last mile distribution. So we formed a company called Spring Health. So you've got to have brand identity and brand loyalty. So Spring Health, uh, uh, that's 50 full-time people in India, and builds a tank next to a, a Karana shop in India. This is a typical mom and pop shop in a village. That tank is filled with water uh, contaminated with fecal pathogens. Uh, the person uses, uh, adds uh, the water that you get from electrochlorination to sterilize the tank. 
and sells the drinking water. And what we do now is we, we thought that the people would prefer to pay a third less and come with their containers to the shop. But no, 80% prefer to pay 30% more and have it delivered to their homes. So we contract now with 200, we're in 200 villages uh, in India. We contract with local shopkeepers. They buy an auto rickshaw. We started with a bicycle rickshaw, which could carry uh, 20 jerry cans to people's homes. But, uh, and we thought that would be too expensive, that the shopkeeper could not, well, uh, you know, once you have a bicycle rickshaw, that's a business in itself. But people preferred, if you buy a, 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 a mechanized rickshaw, like with a diesel engine driving it, you can put 100 jerry cans and it's much more efficient. So this, what we're using now is a, a diesel powered auto rickshaw distribution system that delivers 10 liter jerry cans that are branded to people's homes using a partner with a partnership with a local Karana shop. So that's the way these things, did. I, I, I think the most important part of this is not this specific thing, but the process that works that is fairly straightforward that works, if it works in India, why, why couldn't it work? For instance, sir, you were talking about your groups. Uh, why couldn't that process identify ways of helping poverty in, uh, with the people that you see that are poor? Uh, because I, I have no doubt that if they could find ways of doubling their income, it would make a profound impact on their health. Does that make sense to you from your experience? OK. So aspirational branding and marketing. Pretty much everybody, all the commercial systems use aspirational branding. It's even more important for $2 a day customers. So you have to learn, uh, I didn't know about this stuff, but you have to learn how to do aspirational branding and include it in your marketing approach. So to wrap it up, how can we transform climate change, population growth, war, hunger, education, water, health, and energy. <coughs> Create a new breed of frontier multinationals that serve $2 a day customers in poor countries and similarly poor customers here. All it takes is one person with a dream And that person, probably there's several people that fit the bill in the audience today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pollock, for this very interesting presentation and some of your experience and really tremendous impact globally to those uh, population is, is truly make a, a different um, in many of the society that you have served and has been uh, able to, to assist them.